any of our youngsters are still here, our uh, preschool through fourth graders, you are dismissed if you would like to head on down to our children's church. We've got an age-appropriate lesson in our lower level for those younger students to learn and hear and uh, be hopefully reached and, and informed and educated in the natures and wills of God. So good, good team, good, good, good team helping lead that. We are thankful that they partner with us for that. Well, if you haven't been here the last few weeks, uh, you didn't know, and I'm going to inform you, we are in this sermon series called Blessed, and this is our third week of it, but actually our fourth sermon of it, because uh, the very first sermon out of this Blessed series I stole and used during the 21 days of prayer talking about Jacob. And as we go through this, we've been looking at the life of Jacob. We're in the book of Genesis, first book in your Bible. If you don't have a Bible, there's some in the chairs. There's also some out on the Welcome Center. If you don't own a Bible, feel free to take one of those Welcome Center Bibles home with you. If there's not any there left, I can get you some more out of my office. We want to make sure everybody has the Word of God, a copy of their own, able to read it whenever you would like. And so take one of those and be blessed by it, I guess. And uh, we've been studying Jacob and learning about his life and we're going to continue with that today, and we're going to see and get, continue to see, as we've been seeing, that it's just amazing uh, uh, how God has continued to bless Jacob in spite of all of his mistakes, in spite of all of his flaws, in spite of all of his failures. And now what we're going to read and hear today is it's going to sound almost as if it came off the, the, the television, right? Right out of a soap opera. This guy's got some drama in his life. And, and if you're into soaps... Um, you're going to love what we, we study today because it's very much, you know, this, this could have been straight out of, what do, you, what do you like, All My Children, General Hospital, we got fans of any of the soaps, right? Or, or, or if you're a man, WWE, wrestling, that's just a male soap opera, let's be real about it. Pro wrestling, soap opera, okay? Come on. Um, it might be good, but still a soap opera, let's be honest. But uh, you're, you're going to see today... Uh, uh, there's going to be love, there's going to be romance, there's going to be some plot twists, there's going to be sisters fighting over a man, all of that, right? And, and if you haven't been here the last couple of weeks, let me kind of catch you up with what we've been talking about real quick. Jacob is the youngest brother in his family, and, and he's a known con man. He's known for conning his dad and his dying, his dying dad at that, and his brother. And, and the name Jacob itself actually means deceiver. So if your name's Jacob, I'm sorry, I apologize. But the name Jacob back in biblical times meant you were a shady guy, right? And, and, then, and honestly, when I think of Jacob, as I've been reading through these stories again and studying here in Genesis, as I think of Jacob, the guy who best suits him, who pops into my head whenever I read about Jacob, is actually that old TV character, Boss Hogg. You guys know Dukes of Hazard. When, when I think of Jacob, I see Boss Hogg, right? Boss Hogg, if you don't know Dukes of Hazzard, and I suspect you all know Dukes of Hazzard because, come on, it's America, we have to know Dukes of Hazzard. But if you don't know Dukes of Hazzard, Boss Hogg was this, this, this guy who always had some mangle, always had some scam, always had some scheme. He was trying to enrich himself. He was, it was greed just motivating him and, and, you know, just that whole thing. And if you know Boss Hogg, you know what I'm talking about. And he was always trying to deceive people, right? And there's always something shady, and he wasn't supposed to be shady. He was supposed to be leading, you know, the local government and everything, but he was, he was, he was a character, right? And uh, when I think of Jacob, I kind of see Boss Hogg in him, right? Always got something going on. But here's what he had going for him. You see, Jacob had this grandfather, kind of a well-liked, popular, well-known guy by the name of Abraham. Anybody ever heard of him? Father Abraham had many sons, right? Anybody want to sing with me? No? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Father Abraham. And, uh, and that's the same guy. That, that was his grandfather. Now, now, back when Abraham and his wife couldn't have any kids, God showed up one day and told him that he was going to bless him, give him a, a family, and make him into a great nation, Right? So God had decided well before Jacob was ever born that Jacob was going to be blessed. And what we've learned over the past few weeks is, is, is that like Jacob, God does not bless us because we deserve it. You see, God blesses us in spite of our mistakes and failures. 
So back to Jacob's story. After, after he runs for his life, literally, because his brother wants to kill him, he had swindled his brother, God shows up in a dream while Jacob is sleeping. He's using a rock as a pillow. He's out in the desert. And God shows up and tells Jacob the very same thing that he had told Abraham. He says, Jacob, you're going to be blessed, and I'm going to make you into a great nation. And what God means is that he is going to cause Jacob's family line to have lots and lots of prosperity, lots of babies, and lots of blessings. And those kids are going to go on to become a great nation. A nation that will be extra special to God, above and beyond any other nation. And that that nation will be blessed. So even after Jacob had to run for his life like a fugitive, God reminds him he's still blessed. Now, all of what I I just recapped for you, you can find in Genesis 28, if you want to go home and read that, if you've missed this. We're going to pick up the story then right after that in Genesis 29 today. And then we're going to see Jacob has now moved on from where he's been sleeping out in the desert using that rock as a pillow. And and, and I can imagine after he, he has this encounter with God and this dream and this experience, I'm sure he's now walking with his head held a little bit higher because God has told him he's going to be blessed, right? And he's probably now walking with with a new level of confidence because God is just showing him, I'm with you and I'm for you and I'm going to bless you. And I just want to remind you that, one more time at least, that, that God's ultimate plan for Jacob is that he's going to make them into a great nation. Okay? So in chapter 29, Jacob meets a beautiful woman. A woman by the name of Rachel. He meets her down at the local watering hole, which is not actually a euphemism. He's at the well. And so he's there at the well. He meets, meets her. And she invites him, come on back to the house, meet my family, and stay with us, right? I think things moved kind of quick in this relationship back in those days. And, and, and Jacob, it seems, at least as we read Scripture, it was one of those kind of love at first sight experiences. Now, you might doubt love at first sight. And and I'm kind of somewhat skeptical of it. But my parents are a love at first sight kind of story. When when my dad first saw my mom, he knew. How that works, I don't know. But that does happen, I guess. And so he decides he wants to marry Rachel. Rachel wants to marry him. Come on back to the house, meet the family, right? And so Rachel's dad, Laban, tells Jacob, if he will work for him for seven years, then he will give his daughter to him to be his wife. And Jacob's like, well, okay, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, he, a typical man, he's not thinking quite clearly at this point. <laughs> he agrees to seven years of service, right? And all the guys are like, what? But guys, we admit it, you've made a stupid decision like this over a woman, haven't you? We all have. And so Jacob agrees to the seven years of working to marry this man's daughter. Now, all the ladies are like, oh, that's so romantic, right? But it gets even better, because I want to read you very specifically, probably the most romantic verse in all of the Bible. (laughs) Hear these words. Genesis 29, 20. It says, so Jacob served seven years to get Rachel but they only seemed like a few days because of his love for her. Oh. Everybody swoon. <laughs> Fellas, just a little side note, a little post-Valentine's note for you here. This is free. I'm not charging for this information, this love advice, but the next time your wife asks you to do something you don't want to do, tell her there's nothing that you won't do because of your love for her, right? I promise you it'll work. So Jacob works seven years. And after that time, he gets to marry Rachel, right? So let's pick up in reading in Genesis 29, 21 through 30. Then Jacob said to Laban, give me my wife. My time is completed and I want to make love to her, is basically what he says. So Laban brought together all the people of the place and gave a feast. But when evening came, he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob and Jacob Then consummated the marriage with her. And Laban gave his servant Zilpath, his daughter, to her as an attendant. Verse 25 says, When morning came, 
Jacob woke up. How'd you get in my bed? There was Leah. So Jacob goes, runs out to Laban. What is this you have done to me? I served you for Rachel, didn't I? Why have you deceived me? Yeah, you can see Laban probably kind of chuckle a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Laban replied, it's not our custom here to give the younger daughter in marriage before the older one. Finish this daughter's bridal week. And then we will give you the younger one also in return for seven more years of work. What does Jacob say? <laughs> okay. <laughs> and so Jacob did. He finished the week with Leah, and then Laban gave him his daughter Rachel to be his wife. Laban gave his servant Bilhah to be his uh, daughter Rachel's attendant or servant. And Jacob then lay with Rachel. And his love for Rachel, the Bible tells us, was greater than his love for Leah. And he worked for Laban for seven more years. So we hear this and we go, Oh, the con man just got conned, right? The deceiver has been deceived. Laban tricked Jacob and gave him Leah. Now for all of you who may think, Well, that's not that bad, right? I'm sure Leah was a lovely girl. I want to read you a verse that I skipped that describes the two daughters. Genesis 29, 16, and 17 say this. It says, Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the older one was Leah. The name of the younger was Rachel. Leah had weak eyes. But Rachel had a lovely figure, and she was beautiful. Right? So the Bible doesn't just exactly come out and say it directly, but Leah was probably a little ugly. It doesn't quite say that, but that's kind of what it's hinting at. It says, she has weak eyes. And it describes Rachel in glowing terms, her lovely figure. She's beautiful. So if your friends are ever trying to set you up on a blind date, and the only way they describe the person is weak eyes, a red flag should go off, right? And here's part of the story that I want you to consider. Because many of us have heard this story many times before, right? I've heard this dozens, if not hundreds of times in my life. But there's more to this story that I think a lot of sermons and, and Bible studies and things don't quite dig into that I want to point out to you. And so think on this for a moment. This deception that Laban just pulled had to have happened with the consent of Rachel. Think about that. She knows he's been working for seven years for her hand. For seven years, she's wanted him. Now, Dad is going to sneak Leah in. Rachel is there, right? She couldn't have not been at the wedding. That would have been a little suspicious if she wasn't anywhere present at the time of the wedding. So she had to have known what was going on. Jacob had worked for seven years. This was love at first sight. Sparks flew, right? Jacob says the years passed as if they were just days. He's still obviously got a burning passion for her. And she knew it. And yet when the wedding time comes, Dad sneaks Leah in. And Rachel says and does nothing. She's complicit in this scam. So many times the story focuses on Laban scamming Jacob, because he did, and, and we should focus on that. But I believe Rachel had a hand in this too. And that adds an extra element, if you think about it, of pain to this deception, right? And I think it's often overlooked at times of, of what he experienced. And I think at this point, finally Jacob begins to understand the pain he probably caused his father when he swindled his father, when he and his mother tag-teamed against good old dying dad. Stealing Esau's blessing. Wisely, though, I think, as we read through this story, if you pay attention, Jacob never blames Rachel. Smart guy. He only gets mad at Laban, right? He saves his outrage for good old dad. Now let's stop and think for a little second of 
all this that's transpired and what's happening. Remember where Jacob is coming from in this story. The last thing we read in chapter 28 was God telling Jacob just how blessed he was, right? He literally said, I am with you and I will watch over you wherever you might go. And then the very next thing that happens to Jacob is he meets a beautiful young woman that he wants to marry, right? And so I'm sure Jacob, in his mind, he's got to be feeling like everything is finally coming together in his life. I mean, he, he just had to abandon his family and run away, but now I've met the girl of my dreams. Woohoo! Life is grand, right? I'm in my time, I'm in my prime, everything's going to be good. His past was behind him, God was starting to bless him, everything's going to work out. But just when Jacob thinks it's all going great, the world turns upside down on him. And he gets something he does not want. He gets something different than what he was expecting. Has that ever happened to you before? Imagine God showed up to you in a dream one day, right? Sleeping. God shows up. And he tells you that he's going to bless you. He's going to make you great. The next morning, you wake up, right? You get a call from an investor and says, I like your idea. I want to give you a million dollars. You're like, awesome. Quit my job. Doing that. So you're going to start your own business. You're going to be successful. God's told you in your dream, you're going to be blessed. But all of a sudden, that money never comes. Everything falls apart. You quit your job to do this and... Now it's not working, and your money's running out, and now you've got to go get a new job. And the only job that's available is you end up flipping burgers at McDonald's for their third shift. And you're standing there over a greasy fryer, 2 a.m. in the morning, wondering, how did life get me here? God told me I was going to be blessed. What brought me to this place? Maybe that... Example's a little far-fetched for you, but how about this one? You fell in love with a handsome man, right? Decided to get married. Together you dreamed of the future, and you felt like God was blessing you. But now 10, 15, 20 years later, 30, 40, whatever it is, it's not what you thought it was going to be. Maybe he doesn't look any more like you thought he would. Sorry, honey. Um, Maybe he's done something to you. You thought it was going to be different. You thought God was going to do something special. But now, blessed is the very last thing that you feel. Maybe you used to dream about your future. You had a dream of success in some career. You had some amazing idea of what your kids might someday do. But somehow, someway, you just ended up having to take a job so you could pay the bills. Just something you could punch the clock. Those dreams kind of, somewhere along the way, died. And yeah, you're working to pay the bills because that's what good people do. But you don't feel as if God is blessing you. Jacob worked for seven years to get the woman he was in love with. And now he has something he does not want. And feels as if he's been taken advantage of by everybody in his life. But notice what Jacob did. Most of us, probably all of us, after what Laban and his family did to us, we would have quit, walked away, or maybe we would have just grabbed Rachel and hit the road and eloped. Right? I don't know where Vegas was then those days, but they would have found somewhere. But Jacob agrees to work for Laban for seven more years. He does the faithful respectable thing, even even when it wasn't done to him. We learn an incredibly powerful lesson from Jacob here. When what you have is not what you want, faithfully work with what you've got. Let me repeat that because I think that's important. When what you have is not what you want, faithfully work with what you have been given. Let me try to connect the dots for you for a second before I wrap this up. I told you at the beginning uh, that, that Jacob's grandfather was Abraham. God had told Abraham that he was blessed and his family would become a great nation, right? Well, if you, you start doing the math, 
you'll find that hasn't really quite happened yet in the Bible, right? Abraham had two sons, Ishmael and Isaac. Isaac ends up having two sons, Esau and Jacob. I don't care how you do that math, you can use the new math. That's four men. Four men after God said he was going to make a great nation, right? This isn't even an above average nation. This is not a great nation. At some point, in someone's family, in order for God's promise to come true, someone's going to have to start having a bunch of babies, basically, right? The way that a family becomes a great nation is by growing at a large rate. And up until this point, it has not happened. So God gives Jacob something he does not want with Leah. But he gives him something that he needs. Look at Genesis 29, 31. When the Lord saw that Leah was not loved, he enabled her to conceive. But Rachel remained childless. Jacob wanted Rachel, but God needed Jacob to be with Leah. Without, without being crude, God needed Jacob's to do some work with what he had. And Leah goes on then to have six sons for Jacob. And this is where the soap opera comes in. Remember I was talking about that? Leah, she gets pregnant with four sons for Jacob right away. But then Rachel's like, I can't have any kids. It's Nothing's happening. Why don't you sleep with my servant? Yeah, it gets freaky. And the servant has two sons. Leah then decides that she wants Jacob to sleep with her servant. And she gets pregnant with the son. And then eventually God will allow Rachel to get pregnant in the end as well. And she has two sons as well. Sounds like an episode of Jerry Springer. But everybody pay attention to what God just did. God sent Jacob to Laban's house to be tricked into marrying a daughter he didn't want, a woman that he didn't love. But with Leah and Rachel, along with her two servants, he would end up having, have you counted? Twelve sons. And those twelve sons would go on to be the twelve tribes of Israel. The nation has started. All because of what Jacob got was not what he wanted. But he faithfully worked with what he was given. We don't have time to keep on reading, but later on in the story, Jacob is going to tell Laban that he wants to leave. So I'm done. I'm through with you. Fourteen years of laboring for you. It's time for me to hit the road. Laban says, well, you can't take any of my livestock with you. But they come to an agreement that Jacob can take the spotted and lame animals, right? And here Jacob again finds himself in a place where, where God had told him he's going to be wealthy and blessed, but he's not getting what he deserves. He's not getting the spoils of his toil, of his work. And so Jacob leaves Laban, and God shows up again in the story in an amazing way. Tells him to take those spotted animals. Now don't worry about it. Because I'm going to make you greater than you could ever imagine. God was telling Jacob, what you have is not what you want. But just faithfully work with what you've got. And I will bless you. So what do we do with that today? Take a look around at your life. Maybe you're not where you thought you were going to be. Things did not turn out as you had planned. Maybe you're let down because God's blessing on your life feels more like work than blessing. And it's not what you want. You dreamed of more. You hoped for more. You expected more. But when what you have is not what you want, Faithfully work with what you've got. I know it can be hard to get up and go to that job that doesn't feel like a blessing. I know it can be hard to serve in a marriage that doesn't feel like a blessing. It doesn't come out to be what you dreamed it might be. But you are blessed nonetheless. Be faithful with what you have. Work it. You are blessed and God knows exactly what he is doing. You don't know what God had planned and you don't know what God has in store. 
but keep at it. Remain faithful. Don't give up. Trust that His plan is greater than your plan. And know that within that, you are truly blessed. Amen? Let's pray.